Welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, this session is on uh, on-demand shared connecting and low emission urban logistics. Uh, my name is Paola Chiarini. I work for uh, DG uh, Mobility and Transport and the Research and Innovation Unit. And I will moderate this session together with uh, Fernando Liesa, um, Secretary General of the Alice Logistics uh, Platform. Um, before diving into all the presentation of the three projects um, that will be um, indeed presented in these sessions, I would like to give you just a few words on terms of policy context. And the policy con context on urban logistics is represented by the Urban Mobility Framework, which was uh, published uh, as part of the um, Efficient and Green Mobility Package in December in 2021. Um, the urban mobility framework covered several aspects of urban mobility, and one of these aspects is indeed zero emission city freight logistics and last mile delivery. And as uh, we know, um, logistics is essential for the functioning of urban economies, but at the same time has a number of externalities like congestions and pollution. Um, the, there are several issues that have been identified uh, in, the, in this urban framework, certain um, points we want to focus on. And uh, one is the collaboration between all the stakeholders and between the local authorities and the private stakeholders to share knowledge in order to have a proper logistics management and planning. And to do this also is necessary to boost the uh, data sharing, the sharing of information to make certain that uh, um, there is uh, the planning is based on evidence and uh, and facts. Another point is the uh, that is fundamental for urban logistics is the rollout of zero emission vehicles used for urban logistics. This is to to support decarbonization of the sector. But also uh, we have been looking into accelerating the deployment and developing and development and deployment of uh, innovative solutions. For instance, uh, uh, cargo bikes, uh, new distribution models, micro hubs, dynamic routing. So the use of urban rail and inland waterways. And at the same time, optimize the use of vehicles and infrastructure to reduce uh, unnecessary and empty runs. Finally, um, there is a point on uh, uh, integrating cities as urban nodes in the overall trans-European transport network. All these are issues that are tackled in the three projects that are going to be presented today, LEED, ULATS and City Changer Cargo Bikes. Um, without, um, let's say, um, for much information, let's move to the specific solutions that are indeed proposed by the projects. And uh, um, I'll pass the floor to uh, Sergio Fernandez for the lead projects. And uh, Sergio leads the International Collaboration Projects Department of the Madrid Public Transport Companies. Sergio, you have 15 minutes and the question sessions will be um, held after the three presentations. Sergio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here today to present LEAD project, which is actually one of those delightful, delightful projects which run very smoothly. So I'm really glad about it. Um, I am the head of the International Collaboration Projects Department of EMT Madrid. EMT Madrid is a public transport operator. And first of all, you may think, what is a public transport operator doing about logistics? And the truth is that since uh, the company was created in 1947, because actually today, I mean, this year is our 75th uh, anniversary, uh, we've been just a bus operator. But since 2013, uh, we have added different mobility services to our portfolio. And one of those services is to manage uh, 28 underground parking facilities in the city of Madrid with more than 12,400 parking lots. And this parking facilities can really play a key role in urban logistics. So um, that's the reason that uh, brought us to LEED. Um, the acronym responds to low emission adaptive last mile logistics, supporting on-demand economy through digital twins. So quite tech title. It started in the 1st of June 2020 uh, with a total budget of around 4 million euro. There are more than 20 partners, including 
some collaboration with uh, China partners, Chinese partners and US partners. And EMT Madrid is the coordinator of this project. We as a public transport operator offering our facilities to deploy some pilots. So which are the objectives? Well, the first one, uh, and, and, and I would like maybe first to frame the context. Uh, we have all experienced on-demand and uh, last mile deliveries. And in the last years, all our homes became a shop. So we are very used to buy from home. And, uh, and this is really posing a lot of challenges, um, especially because from the customer point of view, all of us, we are very exigent and we want an immediate delivery most of the time is at a very low cost or even free of charge. From the point of view of the parcel companies and logistic operators, they want to react promptly to our demand and to cover uh, providing as much offer as possible. So the next uh, step on the chain are cities, which are facing the challenges of congestion, of dealing with increasingly complex operations, and, uh, and that is really, really uh, a challenge that has even go beyond uh, through the pandemic uh, and during the pandemic. We have all seen all the, the last mile deliveries during these times. So what is lead addressing the objectives is to co-design value cases. So starting from a contextual framework, understanding what is going on on, on these six living labs, Madrid, The Hague, Lyon, Porto, Budapest and Oslo, and then uh, by uh, deploying a digital twin, by setting the impact assessment framework as well and developing all the different modules uh, to experiment and uh, check those digital twins in real life by deploying physical pilots. And these pilots also feed back to the digital twin. So it's a kind of cycle process. And um, the last step, would be to define um, how to scale up uh, these, these achievements, how to develop a roadmap, how to help cities in developing data-driven solutions and policy making. So that is what we are trying to address through a lead project. And uh, the six living labs are focusing on different aspects. For instance, in Madrid, we are working on developing the urban consolidation center nearby the M30 uh, ring road, which is a uh, part of the TNT uh, corridors. Um, we also want to explore and go uh, farther in, in private uh, public corporations. Um, in uh, Lyon, they are also validating last mile distributions using um, not only uh, soft modes, but also automated vehicles uh, in a new area. Uh, and uh, in the hack, they are integrating uh, last mile platforms. So how to go forward in cooperation between different platforms uh, to uh, improve uh, demand supply uh, and also in a very specific area of the city, which is a uh, innovation district. In Budapest, they are thinking more on a macro uh, perspective. So how to uh, assess and simulate what's happening uh, with the logistics sector when implementing either a consolidation center or defining different policies. In Porto, this is only the, the, the only one which is fully private. They are mixing energy distribution with re the retail sector. There is a Sonai, the company which is trying to uh, upgrade the uh, network of shops in order to optimize their delivery by using electric vehicles. And finally, Oslo, is exploring a green crowd shipping uh, linked to the public transport network. So by using a micro hub nearby a public transport station, and they're, they're exploring this crowd shipping. So, so citizens themselves are part of the logistic chain. I don't pretend you to read this. I just wanted to inform you that each living lab has set uh, their own targets according to the grant agreement commitments and also uh, have defined uh, 16 different KPIs. So our intention is to measure how, to, how do we achieve those targets in terms of, for instance, reduction of emissions or create, creation of, uh, of employment. The strategies are focused in, on four aspects, um, innovation, uh, innovative business models. So exploring how to make additional business models profitable for the private sector, but at the same time, helping cities to achieve their goals. 
agile freight storage and distribution so not influencing really negatively on their current operations but improving them using low emission delivery vehicles so most of the vehicles which are used are electric zero emission and also move forward the smart data-driven logistics solutions so exploring also how to learn more and how to extract uh, really useful outcomes of all this process and the main innovations beyond the use of these digital twins in the last mile logistics is also linked to this co-creation of the different value cases all linked to this on-demand economy helping cities to embrace technology advancement uh, and the data value and this is something we are all aware of i mean we are all aware that many times we have plenty of data the point is that we don't know what to do with them uh, what to use them for and last but not least, speeding up transition towards the physical internet paradigm. This, I don't pretend you either to read it through, it's just to let you know that this is one of the main outcomes uh, that will be shared with all non-lead partners, which is the library with all the models to create your own tailor-made digital twin. So the technical partners have developed all that series of different models, either uh, for route optimization, for uh, two echelon distribution, one to echelon distribution steps, or for instance to uh, model the emissions using, using uh, the corporate EU model. And all these will be available so you can really pick up which suits you best and define your own uh, digital twin. So the mid to long term expected impacts, the first one is to clear understand uh, the cost-effective strategies and measures and methods to help cities achieving the goal of getting emission-free city logistics by 2030. The second impact is to test and demonstrate new practices for a better cooperation between the public and the private sector, either suppliers, shippers, or urban regions, or, or city policies, uh, city poli uh, policy makers. And the third impact is to clearly provide inputs to feed this policy making process. So, for instance, either the definition or the deployment of the sustainable urban mobility plans or sustainable urban logistic plans, and also based on this big data or data driven approach. So, getting to the end of the presentation, um, exchanging and exploring synergies, the project has defined a transferability platform. Ten cities are so far part of this transferability platform and the idea is to have a more fluent and direct communication with them uh, exchanging all the achievements uh, and tools of the project by this year we will launch this massive online open course we call it MOOC um, and then uh, by synergies we are also exploring the cooperation with other projects for instance do it about capacity building or our sister projects uh, because they belong to the same core senator and you lads you will uh, here about ULATS very shortly. Move 21 about uh, also uh, freight and, and passenger uh, mobility hubs or the platform Alice um, here as well. Uh, we, we also cooperated in the past, launching last December a joint document uh, to help uh, achieving the goals for 2030 about zero emission logistics, but also the living. Uh, EU initiative or uh, with DigiConnect, for instance, also participating uh, at different events. So we are also part of the European network of uh, living labs. So maybe I've been too short. I don't know if I reach it uh, 15 minutes, but the person in touch with me was very strict about the number of slides. So I tried to behave. But if you have any questions, maybe later, don't hesitate. Thank you very much. You did it in 10 minutes. Impressive. <laughs> so thank you, Sergio. And uh, we move on. Uh, uh, well, questions will be at the end of the session. So thank you. And we move on to the second presentation uh, um, of the ULET project, Urban Logistics as an On-Demand Service. Michael, thanks for, for leaching the, the podium. Um, so Michael Glotz-Richter and he's Senior Project Manager for Sustainable Mobility at the Free Anseatic City of Bremen. Michael, please, you have 15 minutes. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, yeah, first of all, a question to you all. Who thinks that urban logistics is one of the core topics for the next years? So please, those who agree on that, please stand up. No, stand up. 
Okay, I can see this is a clear majority and all of you, you have a bit more oxygen now in your brain to listen to the next presentation. Thank you. Yeah, the ULATS project, Urban Logistics as an On-Demand Service, one of the logistics projects. Um, we are more or less in the middle of our process um, and what you see here is a consortium that's truly city-led. And I think it's also something in uh, common with Sergio's presentation that you have not research for research, but research really to see what's in it for the practice on the urban level. And um, that's quite important. We have operators, we have authorities, we have research, we have NGOs all together in the project. And we have a good coverage of Europe as well. So what are the challenges? Why is ULATS so important? First of all, we see a strong increase in the volume of deliveries. And now with the changes that we all see with the COVID pandemic, everyone learned how to order things on the internet. That's one part. But of course, these things will be delivered and we have more and more deliveries and also related problems. So the increase is much stronger than what was anticipated when we started the project. Then what's the challenge? The sector of urban or of logistics in general is an extremely competitive business area. So we have to be quite careful also, what are the instruments to influence the processes? And we see that we have conflicts in transport on the urban level. All these delivery vehicles take space and are in conflict with cycling or public transport or walking, whatever it is. And that's also something that we see in all of our cities. Looking at the climate dimension, we know that transport is a special problem, by far failing what needs to be achieved in the sector of climate protection. And of course, now we have to see how can we deal with that. The Green Deal with Fit for 55 increases the challenge. And we have political targets to achieve essentially CO2-free city logistics in major urban city centers by 2030. We have the Green Deal, and the Green Deal clearly says in the urban mobility framework, we have to deal with efficient zero emission urban logistics and last mile delivery solutions. So that's the scenery that we have for projects like ULATS, like LEED and others. What are the sites for the pilot tests and the what we call laboratories? We have something special as we look very much what is the potential also of the bicycle and cargo cycles. We have three demonstrator cities which are all extremely cycle friendly. We have Bremen, we have a share of 25% of uh, cycling all over the city and 30% in the inner city area. We have Groning with a higher share and the beautiful city of Mechelen, which is just 20 minutes by rail from here. And let's start with the commercial transport. We have competitive market. We have to see what are the business cases, what are technological and technical innovations and what's the regulatory framework. How does it all fit together? And of course, communication with the players on the local level. That's the challenge that we have. And one part is to see what's the role of heavy cargo bikes and micro hubs. Here we see a solution from Bremen with a micro hub and a special heavy cargo bike. And um, funny enough, when we had a demonstration, we bumped into the cycling plumber who's there and um, is doing his business with his bikes already for uh, 15 years. So that's quite interesting. Here you see how it works in the city area. We have deliveries coming in 
um, into that container and these cargo bikes are able to transport a standard container or a standard Euro pallet up to 350 kilograms and then delivering, for instance, in the pedestrian zone or in the little uh, galleries that we have. It's not only a question of the bicycles, it's also the question of the software in the background that's um, around it all. So it needs to work hand in hand, you can um, call it. And we have to see then how can we develop a business case? What's the framework that we need? How can we support it? Even the micro hubs in urban neighborhoods are not easy to locate and also to deal with the question um, how to get the containers from the freight village uh, there. And of course, we want to do an impact analysis. That's pretty clear. We have cargo bikes also in uh, Groning, very well used, very well settled, all kinds of and in Mechelen, very interesting case, we have also B-Post, the Belgian Post involved, or UPS. And um, when you look at the Belgian Post in Mechelen, they will go to a fully electric delivery and in the city center with bicycles and self-propelled uh, trailers. So they have a very ambitious target and that's the um, delivery center of, of the B-Post. We had a visit there and they're really ambitious and you can see it on the ground. So 20 minutes by rail from here. Groning, for instance, also see um, how can you use park and ride stations. People coming in and uh, doing the transit there from um, various uh, vehicles usually from the private car either uh, onto shared bikes or a public transport to get into the city center and to have parcel locker solutions there that means a neutral um, micro depot where you can pick up parcels but it needs to be neutral not only let's say for a special uh, operator and these neutral locker boxes this is a big big task then the question, can you bring together passenger and freight transport? Also with technological uh, innovations. And you have a lot of aspects, including legal aspects of public transport. To what extent can public transport, which is subsidized, interact in a freight sector, which is highly competitive? And this is not a profane question. Uh, so we were looking whether we can use on-demand passenger service and we stranded, I can say. We have so many barriers there, organizational, practical and also legal barriers. It's anything but profane. It sounds so easy and say you make a research project, but I think that's also the privilege of research that you can find out it doesn't work so easily. Um, we will see how it will be. Um, in Mechelen, they want to use uh, some automated minibuses. And there, again, what's special here? It's a passenger. He steps into the vehicle. How is it with parcels? How do they get to the stop and how do they get from the stop to their, what you call, final destination? So this handling is also a big, big question um, for research. And then we have another dimension, which we call the private micro-logistics. For those of you who have kids and bring it to the kindergarten, sometimes it's the excuse to use the car when you go around the corner to get you some new box of mineral water or beer or whatever you prefer. People say, okay, I need to take the car because I cannot transport it with a bike. And um, there the cargo bikes and trailers offer some answers. And we have even IKEA in Hamburg providing cargo bikes and these self-propelled trailers to bring home billies and so on. Yeah, and that's what we do. We have cargo bike sharing and Bremen will extend it and see how the acceptance is. Can we replace private car trips or even contribute to giving up private car ownership in these neighborhoods where we have anyway too many cars? So. That's Eulat's approach. You see, things are coming together. Some in South business cases, technology, research, 
the Green Dale, and we have a very complex structure. And what you see here, it's complex. <laughs> and um, we have the relation of uh, sums to sums. We have the use cases, so we're very practically oriented. We have a multi-stakeholder dialogue in it, and to see how can we deal in sums or sulps the sustainable urban logistic plans with logistics. And when we see again here the ULATS approach, what is missing? It's that the municipalities are in the driver's seat. And I think this is an important message for research projects in general. For all my colleagues from other cities dare to become active and even as a coordinator of such a project. With that message, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much. Numerous cases definitely to take to be considered and very, very efficient speakers. So let's pass now to the third project at City Changer Cargo Bike and uh, um, Sam Pierce, please to the podium. Sam, he's a project manager and Cycling Industries Europe, the European Trade Association for the Bicycle Ecosystem. Sam, 15 minutes for you too. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, it's great to be with everyone here today. Uh, I'm here to tell you a bit about the uh, City Changer Cargo Bike project, which we've been running now um, since uh, 2018. So um, basically, uh, the City Changer Cargo Bike project brings together uh, a number of forerunner and follower cities um, to explore cargo bikes for personal and uh, professional use cases. Um, Obviously, yeah, I mean, we have the 20 partners of the project, 15 of them are city-led, so um, within the consortium. So, you know, like, uh, like my colleagues up here today, um, there's a strong emphasis uh, on cities um, uh, experimenting and, and using cargo bikes uh, for, for their, either for, for personal mobility uh, purposes or for, um, for, for city logistics. Uh, and, and companies that are using cargo bikes uh, for that purpose. So, um, yeah, the objective is really to improve the quality of city life by fully exploiting the huge potential of cargo bikes as a sustainable means of transport for private and commercial logistics purposes. Um, so the, the goals of the project can really sort of be um, synthesized into sort of uh, six points here. The first three are really about um, quality of life uh, and, you know, improving access to cargo bikes, improving uh, you know, making making society more more um, more active, you, uh, allowing people to take active mobility options uh, more readily. Um, secondary to that is the rec reducing con congestion and emissions. Um, obviously, we all know how cargo bikes can uh, transport people and goods and people and children or, or other people, um, and therefore take cars off the road, um, and therefore, yeah improve congestion and, and, and reduce the amount of emissions in the atmosphere. Um, and obviously in Brussels at the moment with all the sort of smog that's happening, it becomes specific, quite, quite relevant. Um, and then obviously uh, increasing safety, increasing livability of cities and improving you know, public space. Um, the business sort of case side of things is also quite prominent within the project. Um, obviously there's new jobs and new opportunities that can be developed from uh, mainstreaming cargo bikes. Um, we also see uh, new funding schemes for cargo bike ownership as, as a sort of way to, to launch uh, cargo bike ownership and, and sort of over time, you know, with, with, um, with economies of scale, cargo bikes becoming cheaper, but uh, for the moment they do, they do still remain quite expensive. So there's been a number of uh, cities around Europe that have uh, put forward um, uh, incentives and, and subsidy schemes to allow people to purchase cargo bikes and, and I'll go through some, some of the specific city partners uh, who have done that uh, today a little bit later but um, the last point is, is uh, also uh, as, as my colleagues were also talking about uh, micro hubs uh, and once, once you can sort of put in those micro hubs um, for, for urban logistics then the, the use case for cargo bikes becomes so much more relevant and so much more applicable um, you know uh, current urban logistics uh, makes it a bit difficult to, to, to bring goods in from outside of cities, uh, you know, from around airports or around, um, you know, e external sort of uh, warehousing areas um, to the city. And if you can start to in improve the access to uh, those hubs, um, make them more, more urban and, and central, um, cargo bikes then sort of become 
far more efficient than 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 vans and um, other motorized forms of transport that you know take up space and, and uh, are less efficient. Um, so within the from from the beginning of the project, these were the the goals, the plan results, or the sort of key performance indicators. Um, you know, we, we're very happy that we've um, been very successful in, in, in achieving um, a lot of the points here. Uh, we've had more than you know, uh, 500 train multipliers, people who have attended and, and participated in, in workshops and um, awareness uh, raising events to sort of bring forward the, the, the knowledge that's been developed within the City Change of Cargo Break. Um, uh, yeah, there's been a number of cities that have been part of the project have put in a number of restrictions for motorised traffic and um, low emission zones to, to sort of obviously push forward the the, the utility of cargo bikes as well. Um, rental sharing systems uh, have been a, a real success uh, as well within within the project. Um, the areas where we have had some um, uh, challenges uh, and obstacles have been around uh, bike test trials, the 10,000 that were sort of pre. Uh, um, foreseen at the beginning of the project um, have, uh, it's been difficult to obviously count the amount of people we, we, within all the sort of trials. Uh, and also, you know, um, the, the developing new, um, the new cargo bike owners being able to sort of uh, attribute um, uh, the purchase of new cargo bikes uh, to, to the project is, has also been a sort of a little bit more tricky than, than initially anticipated. But uh, we, we do have figures that still show that you know, there, there has been success in these areas, just not to the degree that we were sort of initially foresaw. Um, and yeah, this is just a sort of quick quote to, to sort of uh, make the point a little bit clearer, I think, you know, um, SUVs in cities really don't make sense. Uh, they weren't made for that in, the, in their first sort of iterations and they're still not really relevant and uh and and yeah the cargo bike i think is the thing that can sort of replace that allow people to transport goods uh people uh and and still you know make their cities more livable um so going into specifics about each of the sort of well uh, some of the uh some of the cities that have been involved in the project um strasbourg is um the first one i'd just like to start off with i mean They've put in a number of subsidies. All the cities have done subsidies and, and, and loans. So, you know, there's been a lot of um, a lot of uh, support given by the municipalities for uh, purchase of cargo bikes. Um, Strasbourg were able to support 74 people in the purchase of their cargo bike uh, through a uh, 500 euro uh, purchase scheme. Um, but what was really interesting with Strasbourg has been the uh, the fact that they've developed a a bike rack, which you can see in this photo here. Um, Obviously, bike, bike, uh, cargo bike parking is a bit of a challenge. Uh, currently, infrastructure doesn't really allow for that. Uh, current bike racks are usually made for um, normal, traditional analog bikes. Um, and, and yeah, the, the, the cargo bike obviously takes up more space uh, and, and therefore requires a, a sort of specific uh, point of attachment. Um, so the, the, the standard they've developed here was um, chosen out of 105 candidates and um, and yeah I think uh, it's a real uh, testament to the sort of innovation within the project um, it's something that could be carried forward in other cities around the world and, and, and show best practice um, at a global level um, uh, another example for, uh, just quickly for Strasbourg is yeah, they, they've uh, the city itself has put in place um, cargo bikes for a number of its services the the lighting cleaning sanitation uh, services within the city have all sort of uh, been transferred to to, to cargo bikes and in, yeah I think quite nice um, uh, the city's also purchased a number of uh, larger cargo bikes to transport children up to eight children um, to, to transport yeah uh, kids between nurseries and schools so I think that's a, a nice sort of um, way that emphasizes how useful cargo bikes can be for everyone in society. Uh, Mechelen was another um, uh, city that's been involved in this project uh, and the focus here um, has really been on uh, supporting entrepreneurs and small and medium-sized businesses. Uh, so a unique angle that, that Mechelen took uh, within the project. Um, they have been able to uh, support uh, over 52 uh, entrepreneurs and small um, businesses with cargo bikes. Here it's a, uh, a, a grocery 
uh, greengrocers that you know now they can uh, instead of using a van use a cargo bike to, to make their deliveries to, to local customers um, other examples include uh, bakers butchers I mean you know funnily enough that was the technology that was used a uh, hundred years ago and we are seeing a sort of uh, a, a move back to that um, and the fact that you know now we have e-bikes makes uh, transporting loads of up to 350 kilos on these um, on these sorts of cargo bikes uh, just very practical even in hilly cities or, or windy cities so um, so Mechelen yeah as I said had a specific focus on entrepreneurs um, and and they also launched a cargo bike sharing system uh, a company called Kagaru a, a Dutch company called a uh, Dutch um, uh, cargo bike sharing company called Kagaru have been able to uh, deploy their bikes and uh, yeah the city has 261 active users of those cargo bikes so it's un they're, they're only nine cargo bikes but they are being heavily used by by the citizens um, and um, the last city uh, that I'll just go through today was uh, the city of Lisbon um, so here uh, another sort of unique approach um, that had been taken by Lisbon was uh, there was a real sort of political um, support for cargo bikes here it's the deputy mayor um, who created a, a LinkedIn diary um, of his use of his cargo bike on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that included obviously taking his kids to, to school, um, doing the shopping, doing, you know, everyday things that he probably would have done with a car before. But um, yeah, he, he was really enamored with the cargo bike when, when, he, when, the, when Lisbon joined the project and um, became a, a really sort of strong proponent for, for cargo bikes um, within the city. Um, they were also quite, uh, the city of Lisbon was also quite um, uh, active when it came to um, uh, parking for cargo bikes. They put in place uh, over 400 par parking, uh, cargo bike parking spaces, still just traditional racks, but just allowing more space um, and, and a number of enclosed cargo bike spaces because obviously uh, cargo bikes aren't cheap um, and leaving them on the street can be... Uh, a bit dangerous or, or sort of you know leaving yourself open to, to theft I mean e-bikes are, are, are sort of expensive enough but when you get into cargo bikes it does become um, a real uh, safety and security issue so the city put in place a number of closed car park uh, closed bike parking stations um, and and, they, and they've been obviously a success um, and uh, yeah another unique element of the project uh, that Lisbon carried out was the discussions with insurance companies um, there is obviously um, a potential for risk with the, with cargo bikes. They are bigger and heavier, and once they are loaded up, um, they they do pose uh, a bit more of a threat uh, than a normal than a normal bike. So, working with insurance companies to provide um, the adequate uh, adequate um, uh, financial support uh, was uh, was also uh, a unique element of the of the Lisbon project. Um, so as I've said, there's been a lot which achieved within the project, but we still obviously see a lot that can be taken forward. Um, uh, one first off could just, you know, utilizing other multimodality options, using trains, using um, buses, uh, as, as my colleagues were talking about before, um, combining different forms uh, of, 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 of transport mobility to allow the use uh, and transport, transport of packages and then you know, final delivery by cargo bike, final uh, last mile delivery by cargo bike uh, makes a lot of sense. It is uh, something that is still under development, but, um, but, but um, theoretically it's, it's, it does provide a lot of uh, opportunities. Um, transporting people of different ages, um, you know, it, it is an extremely access accessible um, form of transport and an and extremely efficient form of transport for, for, for transporting uh, numerous people. So um, there's a lot more that can be done, uh, we feel, there. Um, uh, I discussed, you know, entrepreneurs and, and, and uh, small and medium-sized businesses, um, but tradespeople as well. Um, there is, there's a huge potential for tradespeople to move to, uh, to cargo bikes. This is a, a tradesman who is based in Paris um, and he's a, he's a plumber, but, um, you know, potentially that could exist for electricians, for carpenters. Um, yeah, there's the, the, the sort of, the, the possibilities are almost endless with, with tradespeople uh, and, and the use of cargo bikes. Uh, and then really cycle logistics um, itself, uh, companies taking on the challenge of, of using cargo bikes to uh, make that shift from um, uh, cars 
and uh, and and moving to uh, to cargo bikes can it can be done. Zetify, this is a company based in the UK. They're in eleven cities in the UK, um, and you know. Uh, we can see that you know there are different size cargo bikes for different uh, applications, um, but you know there and more can be done around stuff like containerization, uh, standardization. Um, but yeah, there there is there's a lot of opportunity there um, to to make uh, cycle logistics more efficient and more um, more uh, applicable in in cities around um, around Europe. Uh, and one sort of long term. Um, element of the project that I just want to highlight today was um, a number of simulation models that had been developed uh, within the project. So um, uh, here we have a specific example, which was uh, Krakow in Poland, but um, this was carried out uh, through throughout a number of the the, the pilot cities, um, and it was basically involving counting the the, the vehicles in city and being able to uh, assess uh, what. Uh, of those vehicles could have been um, uh, um, shifted to, to cargo bikes, uh, especially for deliveries. Uh, and, and you know the the the, the savings and in pollution when it came to CO2, uh, sulfur dioxide, and and lead, uh, all sort of um, major issues when it comes to um, emissions and air quality. Uh, the, the, there was a significant reduction. Basically, uh, these figures show that that could be um, that could be achieved uh, if those if those uh, deliveries and and um, forms of transport had been changed to uh, to cargo bike. So um, so that's something that obviously you know very relevant for uh, wider EU policy and, and something that the the project there's a bit of a legacy for the project to sort of point to the benefits that can be have that can can be had when it comes to our air pollution. Um, and uh, yeah, final slide, just uh, one other thing, um, on our website, www.cyclogistics.com, um, there's a number of resources that are available uh, for, for all different types of uh, uh, use cases. There's, there's um, uh, brochures on you know, um, uh, a city guide uh, for, for mayors, for implementing cargo bikes, for families, for small businesses. Um, we've done a lot of work in sort of uh, illustrating the utility of cargo bikes for as many people as possible and how to implement cargo bikes uh, from, from all, sorts, all sorts of different perspectives. So uh, I do invite you to also um, follow us on social media and visit us uh, on our website to get uh, further resource and uh, information there. Uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, for such um, a thorough overview of uh, possible use for a cargo bike. So thanks to the three coordinators, um, speakers, and we start now with the question and answer session. I pass the floor to you, Fernando, to moderate this, uh, this part of the session. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Fernando Lies. I'm the Secretary General of ALICE, the Alliance for Logistics Innovation through Collaboration in Europe and these three projects are very close to our activity. Before going to the question and answers, I, I will ask you to ask questions and, and to, the, to the different coordinators on these uh, very interesting projects. But I have been asked to do a very uh, technical summary of uh, the main achievements uh, out of the project. But uh, it's quite complicated to do it. I'm, I'm going to do a, a, a sole try. I, I will start with the, with the last uh, project with the uh, City Charger cargo bike, because actually this project uh, started in 2018, if I'm correct. So it was uh, already four years ago. In that time, I think it was very innovative to start working uh, on cargo bikes, how to scale them up. And, and I, I, I think as the project has evolved, this has been a reality and quite sure all the cities were involved were really taking and implementing uh, all the uh, learnings out of the of the project i think uh, one of the main elements here is that when you look into this topic say okay that's cargo bike but uh, it's what uh, samuel said there are different cargo bikes for different types of applications i think this has been quite complex to learn uh, how you can get these uh, cargo bikes into the different applications, make them work, make them compatible, and then later this is now in uh, new projects uh, combined with uh, uh, city hubs that it's uh, also in the new evolution of, of this. I think that was uh, very, very important and very prominent on the, on the first uh, uh, project. 
then going back to uh, LEED and ULATS. Uh, as you could see, these projects are more or less in the middle of the, of the project. And the ambition was uh, really more looking into uh, the digitalization. I think that was uh, one of the missing points in previous uh, research and innovation projects in, in city logistics, uh, the digital, digital part. And, and it's also very prominent now in the urban mobility framework. And these projects are really uh, addressing uh, these subjects. In particular, I think LEED is also quite uh, first in class because I, I, when, when you talk now about uh, digital twins, uh, you, you get them, but uh, this project was looking into digital twins, even if in the call this was not mentioned. So then I think it the, the team was really there three years ago already thinking on this. And, and of course, other concepts, very advanced and concepts like uh, physical internet, how to make better use of the of the assets, the parking slots, so then how we can make the transition to zero emissions more, more affordable. And I think that's uh, those uh, points are really important. Also, the concept of the data-driven policies that is applied also in, in Madrid and in other cities. Uh, I think that's quite quite innovative. Of course, crowd shipping that was addressed both uh, lead in uh, ULATS. This was in the in the call topic, so it need to be addressed. I think one of the things I I like very much is the open open library of models for digital twins. So at the end, this is one of the main problems on data sharing, but also on digital, digital twins. If we want to make use of digital twins, we need to have models and we cannot use as many models as the scenarios we have, because if not, this cannot be scalable. And make them open, I think it's a good way to achieve this, uh, that digital twins are really usable in many different applications. Final with ULATS, I think, um, this project is really uh, addressing quite uh, uh, leading cities in urban logistics. And they are not the biggest cities in Europe, but probably are the, the most advanced in terms of uh, thinking thoughts in uh, urban logistics. And then you can see this when you see the, the presentation of the, of the project. Particularly, I think the, these projects were timely because of the increase of deliveries because of COVID-19, and also this is more and more important in order to achieve uh, zero emissions uh, deliveries. I think also uh, it was, I understand cities need to be in the, in the how you said? Driver's seat. In the driver's seat. In the saddle. In the, yeah, but I, I, I think it's really critical to have strong industry partners as you have like UPS or BPOS that are really moving into this transition to zero emissions and collaboration is key to really achieve this. And I can understand cities are in the driven seat, but if the companies cannot make it work, I don't think this will have a clear future. So then that, that's also a quite a innovative that really having leading companies as part of these projects, uh, it's uh, making, making a difference. And I think this was my, my summary of the, of, the, of the projects. I, I'm sure I have not been fair in making it because you, you have made much more, but you had 15 minutes and I have three minutes to do the summary of the 45 minutes. Then now questions. Okay, yeah, in there, there are three, four, I can see. Please, um, if you can tell your, your name, affiliation, and yes. then the question. Thank you for good presentations. Um, my name is Eva Arestad. I'm an EU advisor for SAMS Norway, a cluster focusing on autonomous mobility. And uh, my question is for Michael glotz Richter, um, most in regards to the city of Bremen rather than the project as such. But um, in regards to having the municipality in the driver's seat, as you said, does the city of Bremen have any incentives or dedicated means in order to encourage private companies to take a bigger responsibility for sustainable transport? Uh, not just um, thinking about the ones working with logistics, um, but maybe taking their staff in a sustainable way to the workplace or any other means of transport within the companies? Thank you. Let's go question per, per question, so then if... 
Yeah, Eva, thank you for uh, the question. How to encourage the private sector uh, as, a, as a city? Um, of course, it's, it's a wider range of what we do in sustainable uh, mobility plans. So um, if you want to, let's take the example of, of, of cargo bikes. It's not only that you provide cargo bikes or so, but you have to provide an infrastructure and um, also, for instance, it starts with the infrastructure. It's not only the cycle paths or cycle roads or cycle lanes. It starts with cycle parking at home and on the company premises. For instance, in our building regulations since 1996, every new building has to provide bike parking. It's a very little uh, module, but it's, you have to have to see it as a chain and uh, you know, the, the weakest element of the chain determines how strong a chain is. Um, the dialogue that we have with companies, also within ULATS, we have a local a forum where we discuss things like this. Um, it's not only the only uh, level, but the communication is key, that we also understand as a, as a municipality, how does the business work and what are the requirements and they have to understand our uh, situation and this goes only in a trustful communication way i think these are modules the framework setting in in terms of transport we, we have a history we we started in in the 90s with a, a freight village we tried out various forms of city logistics of consolidation centers and learned that this is anything but an easy business but this developed a little bit um, the network and to know how far can we go as a city and how far can the business sector go and where do we have the overlap? And this overlap area is where we want to work in, in ULATS. Perfect. Thank you. There was one there. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Christian Rousseau working for Renault. Uh, I have two questions. First, a very straight one. What is the amount of, uh, in terms of percentage of the operational cost or operational revenue, what is the percentage of the subsidies? Because I've, I've subsidized, because I've seen that of all the, those deployments, there, there were absolutely needs for uh, sub, uh, subsidies. That's the first one. The second one is, uh, can we, have you, is it, uh, no, uh, the, the, Sorry, it's the same, uh, for still the first one. Can we, can we uh, take uh, from this experimentation, can we have some kind of recommendation in terms of what is the needed level of subsidies? Mm -hmm. uh, the second question, uh, we, we are thinking, I mean, many stakeholders are thinking about a better evaluation, better assessment of the uh, positive externalities. Have you, uh, uh, I've seen that there were some simulation in the last presentation about the emissions, the CO2 and the pollutant emissions. There are other externalities, of course, positive externalities. Have you also tried to assess those externalities which can be then put in front of, of the subsidies, subsidies as, a, as some kind of trade-off or balance or uh, justification? Thank you. Uh, is the question for a particular speaker? I think it's more for Samuel, if I understood correctly because of the question. N not really for okay. someone, but in particular, I think okay. uh, they, they can try to understand. Samuel, do you? Yeah, um, I mean, I can quickly uh, comment uh, for the subsidies. I mean, uh, we see subsidies uh, being put in place at, at varying levels. Um, I mean, within Germany alone, uh, you have subsidies given by um, the region, uh, by the city. Um, I think, I'm not sure if it's at the national level, but definitely there are subsidies of varying amounts depending on yeah, the city and, and the location. Um, I think it's also the same thing in, in, in Paris. Um, uh, Ile de France gives a, it gives a certain subsidy. Uh, a certain level, and then also the Mairie de Paris also gives a, a level of, of subsidy, and you can uh, combine the two also when it comes to uh, comes to the purchase of a cargo bike. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, my colleagues also have some further information there. Uh, and in terms oh. of 
Sorry, that's okay. Uh, just for the last point as well. And no, we haven't. We haven't. Um, that was that was sort of one of the final um, deliverables of um, of the project. Looking at the the, the negative externalities um, associated with um, uh, sort of uh, motorised transport in in cities, motorised uh, vehicles in cities. Um, Overlaying that with the subsidies isn't something that we sort of envisaged uh, at the beginning of the project, but uh, yeah, definitely also provides some some further work and and yeah, uh, putting the two together would would, would potentially make uh, sense in some cases. So um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea. But the the level of subsidies can be quite low. Even there are areas which have developed purely market based. It's a question. For the operator, how efficient is the current delivery situation or the delivery system? Um, when they got stuck in congestion, when they don't find a parking, when they have to pay fines because of illegal parking, this is always time of staff. And when you are able to operate more efficiently with cargo bikes, then there is a shift from market. And it started with courier services, with the little things that they more or less envelopes usually, or little packages that they transport. And we have in Bremen, um, in the inner city area, these courier services by bike, purely market-based for maybe 25 years. So it's now to, do, to go further from the, yeah, that size of things, to larger sizes, and it's quite interesting. The average parcel that they transport in the with the heavy bikes is 68 kilograms. Yeah, so it's really now going into the heavy sector. But for the micro hubs, if you want to go into the neighborhoods, in fact, you need to give some pump uh, priming to to really uh, get it started, and then see for a while does it go. Now, also under the conditions of fuel prices and so on, uh, does it go into a competitive area that we, I mean, it's pretty clear for a city, it can be only just some starting point. We are not willed and not able, and of course, it would be against all the market principles to say there is a continuous uh, subsidizing system. Sorry. Yeah, if I may, um, I think it's also about incentives not, rather than subsidize. So many times uh, a, a logistic operator would please more, for instance, a more favorable delivery time window or uh, access into sensible areas rather than having a subsidized. And we have observed in, in lead project uh, specifically about the, the physical pilot in Madrid, which is this urban consolidation center, actually is rather a micro hub rather than big urban consolidation center. The, the operator is uh, obtaining better uh, performances when delivering this last mile. They are using electric um, three wheelers, uh, electric, uh, they are mopeds, not, not uh, bicycles, but um, three wheelers, and, and, and he's really having a very good performance and, uh, and very good uh, cost effective uh, ratios. So I think it's, it's, it's a mix more than uh, just thinking about subsidizing something or not. And it's all about also policies, how, how cities can incentivize that. If you have higher fines for illegal parking, yeah, this will already change the business case for the operators uh, drastically. The density of enforcement. Yeah? So these are all aspects that they take into account when creating their business plan. And you can influence that as a city, um, of course, indirectly. So, and I, might also just, I might also just add to that. Um, so I, to clarify, I was sort of more speaking about uh, individuals, uh, less about the sort of um, commercial applications. But um, uh, yeah, on the, on the back of that, it's, it's also about infrastructure as well. Um, you know, a lot of cycle um, infrastructure is still currently being built around uh, Individual, individual personal uh, cyclists um, and and cycle lanes essentially need to get a little bit wider uh, for, for some of the bigger cargo bikes that you see uh, to allow overtaking, to allow you know um, vehicles to, to stop uh, or to park. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that also needs to be done uh, there too. But 
that's okay thank you very much i have two three quest four questions five questions i don't know if i can i, I go in order okay so here we have the first uh, one i think it's here Yeah. Uh, good evening, thanks for the presentations. My name is Joris Kreis. Um, I'm actually a lucky guy because I represent from Maritime all the way to uh, Last Mile Logistics in what I do. So I represent Port Expertise, Clean Connect and a new company which is under development, MZGO. Um, MZGO is going to actually perform standardization of both the equipment used as well as the data being uh, um, exchanged um, across the supply chains and we'll be starting with the first and last mile logistics. I have a question to all three of you actually. Um, there is a common theme which comes out of it and that is um, two things. One is you need to implement either micro hubs, a number of city hubs, um, then you have the infrastructure. So across the three project experiences, you've seen the same thing is needed. And my question towards that is how, and maybe Alice can be part of that too, um, how are you going to duplicate this across cities in Europe? Because we know this is truly the need everywhere. Um, there is too much a mix of transportation means from long distance transportations going into the city um, and you can't have bikes going to large uh, di distribution centers either. So the organization of infrastructure, including the micro hubs and the city hubs is essential to make it all happen, right? So that's a question to all three of you. And how is it going to be multiplicated to other cities in Europe? Uh well, I mean, it's, it's, it's great that we would be able to uh, replicate that all across Europe, but at the city level, we have quite a lot of work to do within our own borders, I guess. So uh, just for your information, I mean, the idea of exploring micro hub solutions was included within the um, uh, sustainability strategy of the city of Madrid. The so-called Madrid 360 strategy was launched in 2019. Uh, so now we are working on, on, on just deploying micro hubs all across the city. And it is not an easy task, uh, especially because when you think about uh, sharing the space among different uh, operators, there is always uh, some reluctancy uh, from them to share a space, maybe to lose the branding, or uh, if we want to go even beyond uh, and uh, explore a proper cooperation between different operators, the question of the data, standardization of data. And most of the operators have, I would say, very particular data formats because the most different it is this format, uh, the safest they think their business model is uh, in terms of uh, facing competitors. And sometimes that's really a difficulty uh, when, when, when sharing, for instance, uh, platforms uh, or, or exploring crowd shipping or other solutions. So I guess the replica replication of micro hubs would be something to, to maybe uh, explore from uh, a regulatory aspect or, or a strategic aspect, maybe a wider, maybe going to European level or national level uh, within the national mobility strategies or logistic strategies or even beyond. Uh, but I don't think that a solution is part of the cities despite the fact that we can organize workshops, we participate in different networks and we share our experiences and knowledge. But um, I, I don't see another possibility, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, we are in contact with many, many cities. We are sharing very similar problems. Yeah? Having too many cars, congestion, noise, accidents, quality of life, efficiency, of transport as such. That's uh, a big, big topic. And um, what we can do is sharing the experience. I always call it sharing the experience and not the solutions because the solutions should be really developed, tailorized for every city. But we can, by 
talking about not only the best practice cases. That's it. What's one of the problems that we like to talk about best practice, but we should talk about experience, also about things that did not work. And that's the privilege, as I said, of research projects, different to demonstration things, that you can say, okay, we learned it doesn't work. Uh, it's quite difficult for a politician to go on stage and tell the taxpayers, oh, we spent 100,000 euros on something that did not work. Um, I mean, in a research project, you can do that because that's what research is for. But when you duplicate that experience, then there is a problem because you did not talk about the experience. And that's, I think, quite important on the city to city level, not only talk about things that work well, but talk about things that don't work, that you don't that you don't duplicate that kind of experience. And I think that's what we have. Networks for Euro cities is involved in, 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 in ULADS, for instance. And um, that's also rather in workshops than on big conferences that you talk about things you should not do and should not duplicate. But that's, it requires a little bit um, braveness that people say, OK, it did not work. We always love to talk about best practice, but we should talk about practice, uh, about experience. I don't call it bad practice because that's not the case. It's experience. So, okay. um, uh, sorry. using these cities, but what will Alice do in this perspective? Uh, okay, I, I think it's very clear. When you see the answer from Sergio, every city has its own boundaries. Our companies, or the companies in Alice, are working across the cities. So the, the more stable, the more replicable are the solutions, the better they are going to implement. So if you want to go to the second third, then you need to talk to the industry, because they are going to make it work in different cities, as there are some examples in the projects that are work. So then that's, I think, also important. Industry is involved, because in terms of scalability, replicability, they are going to be in their main interest. They can do the same type of processes in many different cities in Europe, and that's what they, what they do. But I, I'm really sorry for the questions that are missing. Uh, we are urged to finish the session. There is a lot of people, there are a lot of people uh, waiting for us because there is now the ceremony. So if you have questions, happy to answer or happy to you to ask them now. Uh, we have a very important uh, ceremony. Paula, if you can help me. Yes. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, now there is uh, the signature ceremony of the collaboration agreement between the EGVIA 420 and with the Batteries European Partnership Association and the Joint Research Centers. And this will be followed by the drinks. So I don't know exactly where the, the uh, signature will be, just outside. Okay, thank you. So I would like to thank uh, all the participants and again I associate to Fernando's apologies for not being able to take all the questions. I'd like to thank the speakers and very disciplined speakers, thank you very much, and Fernando for the co-moderation. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks.